Chapter Twenty Eight of the Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. One of the strangest things in all the strange course of our human life is the suddenness of certain unlooked for events, which, in a day or even an hour, may work utter devastation where there has been more or less peace, and hopeless ruin where there has been comparative safety. Like the shock of an earthquake, the clamorous incidents thunder in on the regular routine of ordinary life, crumbling down our hopes, breaking our hearts, and scattering our pleasures into the dust and ashes of despair. And this kind of destructive trouble generally happens in the midst of apparent prosperity, without the least warning, and with all the abrupt fierceness of a desert storm. It is constantly made manifest to us in the unexpected and almost instantaneous downfall of certain members of society who have held their heads proudly above their compeers and have presumed to pose as examples of light and leading to the whole community. We see it in the capricious fortunes of kings and statesmen who are in favor one day and disgraced the next, and vast changes are wrought with such inexplicable quickness that it is scarcely wonderful to hear of certain religious sects who, when everything is prospering more than usually well with them, make haste to put on garments of sackcloth and cast ashes on their heads, praying aloud, Prepare us, O Lord, for the evil days which are at hand. The moderation of the Stoics, who considered it impious either to rejoice or grieve, and strove to maintain an equable middle course between the opposing elements of sorrow and joy, without allowing themselves to be led away by overmuch delight or overmuch melancholy, was surely a wise habit of temperament. I, who lived miserably as far as my inner and better consciousness was concerned, was yet outwardly satisfied with the material things of life and the luxuries surrounding me, and I began to take comfort in these things, and with them endeavoured to quell and ignore my more subtle griefs, succeeding so far in that I became more and more of a thorough materialist every day. Loving bodily ease, appetizing food, costly wine, and personal indulgence to a degree that robbed me gradually of even the desire for mental effort. I taught myself, moreover, almost insensibly, to accept and tolerate what I knew of the wanton side of my wife's character. True, I respected her less than the Turk respects the creature of his harem. But like the Turk, I took a certain savage satisfaction in being the possessor of her beauty and with this feeling and the brute passion it engendered i was fain to be content so that for a short time at least the drowsy satisfaction of a well-fed well-mated animal was mine i imagined that nothing short of a stupendous financial catastrophe to the country itself could exhaust my stock of cash and that therefore there was no necessity for me to exert myself in any particular branch of usefulness but simply to eat, drink, and be merry, as Solomon advised. Intellectual activity was paralyzed in me. To take up my pen and write, and make another and higher bid for fame, was an idea that now never entered my mind. I spent my days in ordering about my servants, and practicing the petty pleasures of tyranny on gardeners and grooms, and in generally giving myself airs of importance, mingled with an assumption of toleration and benevolence, for the benefit of all those in my employ. I knew the proper thing to do, well enough. I had not studied the ways of the over-wealthy for nothing. I was aware that the rich man never feels so thoroughly virtuous as when he has inquired after the health of his coachman's wife, and has sent her a couple of pounds for the outfit of her newborn baby. The much prated of kindness of heart and generosity possessed by millionaires generally amounts to this kind of thing, and when, if idly strolling about my parklands, I happened to meet the small child of my lodgekeeper, and then and there bestowed sixpence upon it, I almost felt as if I deserved a throne in heaven at the right hand of the Almighty, so great was my appreciation of my own good nature. Sybil, however, never affected this sort of county magnate beneficence. She did nothing at all among our poor neighbors. The clergyman of the district unfortunately happened to let slip one day a few words to the effect that there was no great want of anything among his parishioners, owing to the continual kindness and attention of Miss Clare, and Sybil never from that moment proffered any assistance. 
now and then she took her graceful person into lily cottage and sat with its happy and studious occupant for an hour and occasionally the fair author herself came and dined with us or had afternoon tea under the branching elms on the lawn but even i intense egoist as i was could see that mavis was scarcely herself on these occasions she was always charming and bright of course indeed the only times in which i was able to partially forget myself and the absurdly increasing importance of my personality in my own esteem were when she with her sweet voice and animated manner brought her wide knowledge of books men and things to bear on the conversation thus raising it to a higher level than was ever reached by my wife or me yet i now and then noticed a certain vague constraint about her and her frank eyes had frequently a pained and questioning look of trouble when they rested for any length of time on the enchanting beauty of sibyl's face and form i however paid little heed to these trifling matters my whole care being to lose myself more and more utterly in the enjoyment of purely physical ease and comfort without troubling myself as to what such self-absorption might lead in the future to be completely without a conscience without a heart and without sentiment was i perceived the best way to keep one's appetite and preserve one's health to go about worrying over the troubles of other people or to put oneself out to do any good in the world would involve such an expenditure of time and trouble as must inevitably spoil one's digestion and i saw that no millionaire or even moderately rich man cares to run the risk of injuring his digestion for the sake of performing a kindness to a poorer fellow creature profiting by the examples presented to me everywhere in society i took care of my digestion and was particular about the way in which my meals were cooked and served particular too as to the fashion in which my wife dressed for those meals for it suited my supreme humour to see her beauty bedecked as suitably and richly as possible that i might have the satisfaction of considering her points with the same epicurean fastidiousness as i considered a dish of truffles or specially prepared game i never thought of the stern and absolute law unto whom much is given even from him should much be required i was scarcely aware of it in fact the new testament was of all books in the world the most unfamiliar to me and while i wilfully deafened myself to the voice of conscience that voice which ever and anon urged me in vain to a nobler existence the clouds were gathering ready to burst above me with that terrific suddenness such as always seems to us who refuse to study the causes of our calamities as astonishing and startling as death itself for we are always more or less startled at death notwithstanding that it is the commonest occurrence known towards the middle of september my royal and distinguished house party arrived and stayed at willowsmere court for a week of course it is understood that whenever the prince of wales honours any private residence with a visit he selects if not all at any rate the greater part of those persons who are to be invited to meet him he did so in the present instance and i was placed in the odd position of having to entertain certain people whom i had never met before and who with the questionable taste frequently exhibited among the upper ten looked upon me merely as the man with the millions the caterer for their provisions and no more directing their chief attention to sibyl who was by virtue of her birth and associations one of their set and pushing me their host more or less into the background however the glory of entertaining royalty more than sufficed for my poor pride at that time and with less self-respect than an honest cur i was content to be snubbed and harassed and worried a hundred times a day by one or the other of the great personages who wandered at will all over my house and grounds and accepted my lavish hospitality many people imagine that it must be an honour to entertain a select party of aristocrats but i on the contrary consider that it is not only a degradation to one's manlier and more independent instincts but also a bore these highly bred highly connected individuals are for the most part unintelligent and devoid of resources in their own minds they are not gifted as conversationalists or wits one gains no intellectual advantage from their society they are simply dull folk with an exaggerated sense of their own importance who expect wherever they go to be amused without trouble to themselves out of all the visitors at willowsmere 
the only one whom it was really a pleasure to serve was the prince of wales himself and amid the many personal irritations i had to suffer from others i found it a positive relief to render him any attention however slight because his manner was always marked by that tact and courtesy which are the best attributes of a true gentleman whether he be prince or peasant in his own affable way he went one afternoon to see mavis clare and came back in high good humour talking for some time of nothing but the author of differences and of the success she had achieved in literature i had asked mavis to join our party before the prince came as i felt pretty sure he would not have erased her name from the list of guests submitted to him but she would not accept and begged me very earnestly not to press the point i like the prince she had said most people like him who know him but i do not always like those who surround him pardon me for my frankness the prince of wales is a social magnet he draws a number of persons after him who by dint of wealth if not intelligence can contrive to push into his set now i am not an advocate of push moreover i do not care to be seen with everybody this is my sinful pride you will say or as our american cousins would put it my cussedness but i assure you mr tempest the best possession i have and one which i value a great deal more even than my literary success is my absolute independence and i would not have it thought even erroneously that i am anxious to mix with the crowd of sycophants and time-servers who are only too ready to take advantage of the prince's good nature and acting upon her determination she had remained more than ever secluded in her cottage nest of foliage and flowers during the progress of the week's festivities the result being as i have stated that the prince dropped in upon her quite casually one day accompanied by his equerry and probably for all i knew had the pleasure of seeing the dove reviewers fed and squabbling over their meal much as we had desired and expected the presence of rimenez at our gathering he did not appear he telegraphed his regrets from paris and followed the telegram by a characteristic letter which ran thus my dear tempest you are very kind to wish to include me your old friend in the party you have invited to meet his royal highness and i only hope you will not think me churlish for refusing to come i am sick to death of royalties i have known so many of them in the course of my existence that i begin to find their society monotonous their positions are all so exactly alike too and moreover have always been alike from the days of solomon in all his glory down to the present blessed era of victoria queen and empress one thirsts for a change at least i do the only monarch that ever fascinated my imagination particularly was richard coeur de leon there was something original and striking about that man and i presume he would have been well worth talking to and charlemagne was doubtless as the slangy young man of the day would observe not half bad but for the rest un fico much talk is there made about her majesty elizabeth who was a shrew and a vixen and bloodthirsty withal the chief glory of her reign was shakespeare and he made kings and queens the dancing puppets of his thought in this though in nothing else i resemble him you will have enough to do in the entertainment of your distinguished guests for i suppose there is no amusement they have not tried and found more or less unsatisfactory and i am sorry i can suggest nothing particularly new for you to do her grace the duchess of rapid dryder is very fond of being tossed in a strong tablecloth between four able-bodied gentlemen of good birth and discretion before going to bed o nights she cannot very well appear on a music-hall stage you know owing to her exalted rank and this is a childlike pretty and harmless method of managing to show her legs which she rightly considers are too shapely to be hidden lady bouncer whose name i see in your list always likes to cheat at cards i would aid and abet her in her aim if i were you as if she can only clear her dressmaker's bill by her winnings at willowsmere she will bear it in mind and be a useful social friend to you the honourable miss fitzgander who has a great reputation for virtue is anxious for pressing and particular reasons to marry lord noodles if you can move on matters between them into a definite engagement of marriage before her lady mother returns from her duty visits in scotland you will be doing her a good turn and saving society a scandal 
to amuse the men i suggest plenty of shooting gambling and unlimited smoking to entertain the prince do little for he is clever enough to entertain himself privately with the folly and humbug of those he sees around him without actually sharing in the petty comedy he is a keen observer and must derive infinite gratification from his constant study of men and manners which is sufficiently deep and searching to fit him for the occupation of even the throne of england i say even for at present till time's great hourglass turns it is the grandest throne in the world the prince reads understands and secretly laughs to scorn the tablecloth vagaries of the duchess of rapidrider the humours of my lady bouncer and the nervous pruderies of the honourable miss fitzgander and there is nothing he will appreciate so much in his reception as a lack of toadyism a sincere demeanour an unostentatious hospitality a simplicity of speech and a total absence of affectation remember this and take my advice for what it is worth of all the royalties at present flourishing on this paltry planet i have the greatest respect for the prince of wales and it is by reason of this very respect that i do not intend on this occasion at any rate to thrust myself upon his notice i shall arrive at willowsmere when your royal festivities are over my homage to your fair spouse the lady sibyl and believe me yours as long as you desire it lucio Rimenez. i laughed over this letter and showed it to my wife who did not laugh she read it through with a closeness of attention that somewhat surprised me and when she laid it down there was a strange look of pain in her eyes how he despises us all she said slowly what scorn underlies his words do you not recognize it he was always a cynic i replied indifferently i never expect him to be anything else he seems to know some of the ways of the women who are coming here she went on in the same musing accents it is as if he read their thoughts and perceived their intentions at a distance her brows knitted frowningly and she seemed for some time absorbed in gloomy meditation but i did not pursue the subject i was too intent on my own fussy preparations for the prince's arrival to care about anything else and as i have said royalty in the person of one of the most genial of men came and went through the whole programme devised for his entertainment and then departed again with his usual courteous acknowledgments for the hospitality offered and accepted leaving us as he generally leaves everybody charmed with his good humour and condescension provided his temper has not been ruffled when with his exit from the scene the whole party broke up leaving my wife and me to our own two selves once more there came a strange silence and desolation over the house that was like the stealthy sense of some approaching calamity sibyl seemed to feel it as much as i did and though we said nothing to each other concerning our mutual sensations i could see that she was under the same cloud of depression as myself she went oftener to lily cottage and always from these visits to the fair-haired student among the roses came back i hopefully fancied in softer mood her very voice was gentler her eyes more thoughtful and tender one evening she said i have been thinking geoffrey that perhaps there is some good in life after all if i could only find it out and live it but you are the last person to help me in such a matter i was sitting in an armchair near the open window smoking and i turned my eyes upon her with some astonishment and a touch of indignation what do you mean sibyl i asked surely you know that i have the greatest desire to see you always in your best aspect many of your ideas have been most repugnant to me stop there she said quickly her eyes flashing as she spoke my ideas have been repugnant to you you say what have you done you as my husband to change those ideas have you not the same base passions as i and do you not give way to them as basely what have i seen in you from day to day that i should take you as an example you are master here and you rule with all the arrogance wealth can give you eat drink and sleep you entertain your acquaintances simply that you may astonish them by the excess of luxury in which you indulge you read and smoke shoot and ride and there an end you are an ordinary 
not an exceptional man. Do you trouble to ask what is wrong with me? Do you try, with the patience of a great love, to set before me nobler aims than those I have consciously or unconsciously imbibed? Do you try to lead me, an erring, passionate, misguided woman, into what I dream of as the light, the light of faith and hope which alone gives peace? And suddenly burying her head in the pillows of the couch on which she leaned, she broke into a fit of smothered weeping. I drew my cigar from my mouth and stared at her helplessly. It was about an hour after dinner, and a warm, soft, autumnal evening. I had eaten and drunk well, and I was drowsy and heavy-brained. "'Dear me,' I murmured. "'You seem very unreasonable, Sybil. I suppose you are hysterical.' She sprang up from the couch. Her tears dried on her cheeks as though by sheer heat of the crimson glow that flushed them, and she laughed wildly. "'Yes, that is it,' she exclaimed. "'Hysteria! Nothing else! It is accountable for everything that moves a woman's nature. A woman has no right to have any emotions that cannot be cured by smelling salts. Heartache? Pooh! Cut her stay-lace. Despair and a sense of sin and misery? Nonsense! Bathe her temples with vinegar. An uneasy conscience? Ha! For an uneasy conscience there is nothing better than sal volatile woman is a toy, a breakable fool's toy, and when she is broken, throw her aside and have done with her. Don't try to piece together the fragile rubbish. She ceased abruptly, panting for breath, and before I could collect my thoughts or find any words wherewith to reply, a tall shadow suddenly darkened the embrasure of the window, and a familiar voice inquired, May I, with the privilege of friendship, enter unannounced? I started up. Rimenez, I cried, seizing him by the hand. Nay, Geoffrey, my homage is due here first, he replied, shaking off my grasp and advancing to Stibble, who stood perfectly still where she had risen up in her strange passion. Lady Sibyl, am I welcome? Can you ask it? she said, with an enchanting smile, and in a voice from which all harshness and excitement had fled. More than welcome. Here she gave him both her hands, which he respectfully kissed. You cannot imagine how much I have longed to see you again. I must apologize for my sudden appearance, Geoffrey, he then observed, turning to me. But as I walked here from the station, and came up your fine avenue of trees, I was so struck with the loveliness of this place, and the exquisite peace of its surroundings, that knowing my way through the grounds, I thought I would just look about, and see if you were anywhere within sight before I presented myself at the conventional door of entrance. And I was not disappointed. I found you, as I expected, enjoying each other's society, the happiest and most fortunate couple existent, people whom, out of all the world, I should be disposed to envy, if I envied worldly happiness at all, which I do not. I glanced at him quickly. He met my gaze with a perfectly unembarrassed air, and I concluded that he had not overheard Sybil's sudden melodramatic outburst. "'Have you dined?' I asked, with my hand on the bell. "'Thanks, yes. The town of Leamington provided me with quite a sumptuous repast of bread and cheese and ale. I am tired of luxuries, you know. That is why I find plain fare delicious. You are looking wonderfully well, Geoffrey. Shall I offend you if I say you are growing, yes, positively stout, with the stoutness befitting a true county gentleman, who means to be as gouty in the future as his respectable ancestors? I smiled, but not altogether with pleasure. It is never agreeable to be called stout in the presence of a beautiful woman, to whom one has only been wedded a matter of three months. You have not put on any extra flesh, I said, by way of feeble retort. No, he admitted, as he disposed his slim, elegant figure in an armchair near my own. The necessary quantity of flesh is a bore to me always. Extra flesh would be a positive infliction. I should like, as the irreverent though reverend Sidney Smith said, on a hot day, to sit in my bones, or rather, to become a spirit of fine essence like Shakespeare's Ariel, if such things were possible and permissible. How admirably married life agrees with you, Lady Sibyl. His fine eyes rested upon her with apparent admiration. 
She flushed under his gaze, I saw, and seemed confused. "'When did you arrive in England?' she inquired. "'Yesterday,' he answered. "'I ran over Channel from Honfleur in my yacht. "'You did not know I had a yacht, did you, Tempest? "'Oh, you must come for a trip in her some day. "'She is a quick vessel, and the weather was fair.' "'Is Emile with you?' I asked. "'No, I left him on board the yacht. "'I can, as the common people say, valet myself for a day or two. "'A day or two? echoed Sybil. "'But you surely will not leave us so soon. "'You promised to make a long visit here.' "'Did I?' "'And he regarded her steadily, "'with the same languorous admiration in his eyes. "'But, my dear Lady Sybil, "'time alters our ideas, "'and I am not sure whether you and your excellent husband "'are of the same opinion as you were "'when you started on your wedding tour. "'You may not want me now.' He said this with a significance to which I paid no heed whatever. "'Not want you!' I exclaimed. "'I shall always want you, Lucio. You are the best friend I ever had, and the only one I care to keep. Believe me, there's my hand upon it!' He looked at me curiously for a minute, then turned his head towards my wife. "'And what does Lady Sybil say?' he asked in a gentle, almost caressing tone. "'Lady Sybil says,' she answered with a smile, and the colour coming and going in her cheeks, that she will be proud and glad if you will consider Willowsmere your home, as long as you have the leisure to make it so, and that she hopes, though you are reputed to be a hater of women. Here she raised her beautiful eyes and fixed them full upon him. You will relent a little in favour of your present chatelaine. With these words and a playful salutation, she passed out of the room into the garden, and stood on the lawn at a little distance from us, her white robes shimmering in the mellow autumnal twilight, and Lucio, springing up from his seat, looked after her, clapping his hand down heavily on my shoulder. "'By heaven,' he said softly, "'a perfect woman. I should be a churl to withstand her, or you, my good Geoffrey,' and he regarded me earnestly. I have led a very devil of a life since I saw you last. It's time I reformed. Upon my soul it is. The peaceful contemplation of virtuous marriage will do me good. Send for my luggage to the station, Geoffrey, and make the best of me. I've come to stay. End of chapter 28《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《
She was herself, in Lucio's presence, strangely erratic of humour, by turns brilliant and mournful, sometimes merry and anon depressed, yet never had she displayed a more captivating grace and charm of manner. How foolish and blind I was, all the while! How dead to any perception of the formation and sequence of events! Absorbed in gross material pleasures, I ignored all the hidden forces that make the history of an individual life no less than of a whole nation, and looked upon each day that dawned almost as if it had been my own creation and possession, to waste as I thought fit, never considering that days are but so many white leaflets from God's chronicle of human life, whereon we place our mark, good or bad, for the just and exact summing up of our thoughts and deeds here and after. Had any one dared to say this truth to me then, I should have bade him go and preach nonsense to children. But now, when I recall those white leaves of days that were unrolled before me, fresh and blank with every sunrise, and with which I did nothing save scrawl my own ego in a foul smudge across each one, I tremble and inwardly pray that I may never be forced to send back my self-written record. Yet of what use is it to pray against eternal law? It is eternal law that we shall ourselves count up our own misdeeds at the final reckoning. Hence it is no wonder that many are found who prefer not to believe in a future after death. Rightly do such esteem it better to die utterly, than be forced to live again and look back upon the willful evil they have done. October ripened slowly and almost imperceptibly towards its end, and the trees put on their gorgeous autumnal tints of burning crimson and gold. The weather remained fine and warm, and what the French Canadians poetically term the summer of all saints, gave us bright days and cloudless moonlit evenings. The air was so mild that we were always able to take our coffee after dinner on the terrace overlooking the lawn in front of the drawing-room and it was on one of these balmy nights that I was the interested spectator of a strange scene between Lucio and Mavis Clare, a scene I should have thought impossible of occurrence, had I not myself witnessed it. Mavis had dined at Willowsmere, she very rarely so honoured us, and there were a few other guests besides. We had lingered over the coffee longer than usual, for Mavis had given an extra charm to the conversation by her eloquent vivacity and bright humour, and all present were anxious to hear, see, and know as much of the brilliant novelist as possible. But when a full golden moon rose in mellow splendour over the treetops, my wife suggested a stroll in the grounds, and everyone agreeing to the proposal with delight, we started, more or less together, some in couples, some in groups of three or four. After a little desultory rambling, however, the party got separated in the rose gardens and adjacent shrubberies, and I found myself alone. I had turned back to the house to get my cigar case, which I had left on a table in the library, and passing out again in another direction, I strolled slowly across the grass, smoking as I went, toward the river, the silver gleam of which could clearly be discerned through the fast thinning foliage overhanging its banks. I had almost reached the path that followed the course of the winding river, when I was brought to a standstill by the sound of voices. One a man's, low and persuasive, the other a woman's, tender, grave, and somewhat tremulous. Neither voice could be mistaken. I recognized Lucio's rich, penetrating tones, and the sweet, vibrante accents of Mavis Clare. Out of sheer surprise I paused. Had Lucio fallen in love, I wondered, half-smiling? Was I about to discover that the supposed woman-hater had been tamed and caught at last? By Mavis, too! Little Mavis, who was not beautiful according to accepted standards, but who had something more than beauty to enravish a proud and unbelieving soul. Here, as my thoughts ran on, I was conscious of a foolish sense of jealousy. Why should he choose Mavis, I thought, out of all the women in the world? Could he not leave her in peace with her dreams, her books, and her flowers, safe under the pure, wise, impassive gaze of Pallas Athena, whose cool brows were never fevered by a touch of passion? Something more than curiosity now impelled me to listen, 
and I cautiously advanced a step or two towards the shadow of a broad elm, where I could see without being seen. Yes, there was Rimenez, standing erect with folded arms, his dark, sad, inscrutable eyes fixed on Mavis, who stood opposite to him a few paces off, looking at him in her turn with an expression of mingled fascination and fear. "'I have asked you, Mavis Clare,' said Lucio slowly, "'to let me serve you. You have genius, a rare quality in a woman, and I would advance your fortunes. I should not be what I am if I did not try to persuade you to let me help on your career. You are not rich. I could show you how to become so. You have a great fame, that I grant, but you have many enemies and slanderers who are forever trying to pull you down from the throne you have won. I could bring these to your feet and make them your slaves. With your intellectual power, your personal grace and gifts of temperament, I could, if you would let me guide you, give you such far-reaching influence as no woman has possessed in this century. I am no boaster. I can do what I say and more, and I ask nothing from you in return except that you should follow my advice implicitly. My advice, let me tell you, is not difficult to follow. Most people find it easy. His expression of face, I thought, was very singular as he spoke. It was so haggard, dreary, and woebegone, that one might have imagined he was making some proposal that was particularly repugnant to him, instead of offering to perform the benevolent action of helping a hard-working literary woman to achieve greater wealth and distinction. I waited expectantly for Mavis to reply. "'You are very good, Prince Rimenez, she said, after a little pause, to take any thought for me at all. I cannot imagine why you should do so, for I am really nothing to you. I have of course heard from Mr. Tempest of your great wealth and influence, and I have no doubt you mean kindly. But I have never owed anything to anyone. No one has ever helped me. I have helped myself, and still prefer to do so. And really, I have nothing to wish for, except, when the time comes, a happy death. It is true I am not rich, but then I do not want to be rich. I would not be the possessor of wealth for all the world. To be surrounded with sycophants and flatterers, never to be able to distinguish false friends from true, to be loved for what you have and not for what you are, oh no, it would be misery to me. And I have never craved for power, except perhaps the power to win love, and that I have. Many people love my books, and through my books love me. I feel their love, though I may never see or know them personally. But I am so conscious of their sympathy that I love them in return without the necessity of personal acquaintance. They have hearts which respond to my heart. That is all the power I care about. You forget your numerous enemies, said Lucio, still morosely regarding her. No, I do not forget them, she returned. But I forgive them. They can do me no harm. As long as I do not lower myself, no one else can lower me. If my own conscience is clear, no reproaches can wound. My life is open to all. People can see how I live and what I do. I try to do well. But if there are those who think I do ill, I am sorry. And if my faults can be amended, I shall be glad to amend them. One must have enemies in this world, that is, if one makes any sort of position. People without enemies are generally non-entities. All who succeed in winning some little place of independence must expect the grudging enmity of hundreds who cannot find even the smallest foothold, and are therefore failures in the battle of life. I pity these sincerely, and when they say or write cruel things of me, I know it is only spleen and disappointment that moves both their tongues and pens, and freely pardon them. They cannot hurt or hinder me. In fact, no one can hurt or hinder me but myself. I heard the trees rustle slightly, a branch cracked, and peering through the leaves, I saw that Lucio had advanced a step closer to where Mavis stood. A faint smile was on his face softening it wonderfully and giving an almost supernatural light to his beautiful dark features. 
fair philosopher you are almost a feminine marcus aurelius in your estimate of men and things he said but you are still a woman and there is one thing lacking to your life of sublime and calm contentment a thing at whose touch philosophy fails and wisdom withers at its root love mavis clare lovers love devoted love blindly passionate this has not been yours as yet to win no heart beats against your own no tender arms caress you you are alone men are for the most part afraid of you being brute fools themselves they like their women to be brute fools also and they grudge you your keen intellect your serene independence yet which is best the adoration of a brute fool, or the loneliness pertaining to a spirit aloft on some snowy mountain peak, with no companions but the stars. Think of it. The years will pass, and you must needs grow old, and with the years will come that solitary neglect which makes age bitter. Now, you will doubtless wonder at my words. Yet believe me, I speak the truth when I say that I can give you love. Not my love, for I love none but I can bring to your feet the proudest men in any country of the world as suitors for your hand. You shall have your choice of them, and your own time for choosing, and whomsoever you love, him shall you wed. Why, what is wrong with you that you shrink from me thus? For she had retreated, and was gazing at him in a kind of horror. You terrify me, she faltered, and as the moonlight fell upon her I could see that she was very pale such promises are incredible impossible you speak as if you were more than human i do not understand you prince rimanez you are different to any one i ever met and and something in me stronger than myself warns me against you what are you why do you talk to me so strangely pardon me if i seem ungrateful oh let us go in it is getting quite late i am sure and i am cold she trembled violently and caught at the branch of a tree to steady herself. Rimanez stood immovably still, regarding her with a fixed and almost mournful gaze. "'You say my life is lonely,' she went on reluctantly, and with a note of pathos in her sweet voice. "'And you suggest love and marriage as the only joys that can make a woman happy. You may be right. I do not presume to assert that you are wrong. I have many married woman friends.' but I would not change my lot with any one of them. I have dreamed of love, but because I have not realized my dream, I am not the less content. If it is God's will that I should be alone all my days, I shall not murmur, for my solitude is not actual loneliness. Work is a good comrade. Then I have books and flowers and birds. I am never really lonely. And that I shall fully realize my dream of love one day, I am sure. If not here, then hereafter." I can wait. As she spoke, she looked up to the placid heavens, where one or two stars twinkled through the arching bows. Her face expressed angelic confidence and perfect peace, and Rimanez advancing a step or two, fully confronted her with a strange light of exaltation in his eyes. True, you can wait, Mavis Clare, he said in deep, clear tones, from which all sadness had fled. You can afford to wait, tell me think for a moment can you remember me is there a time on which you can look back and looking see my face not here but elsewhere think did you ever see me long ago in a far sphere of beauty and light when you were an angel mavis and i was not what i am now how you tremble you need not fear me i would not harm you for a thousand worlds I talk wildly at times, I know. I think of things that are past, long, long past, and I am filled with regrets that burn my soul with fiercer heat than fire. And so neither world's wealth, world's power, nor world's love will tempt you, Mavis. And you, a woman, you are a living miracle, then, as miraculous as the drop of undefiled dew which reflects in its tiny circumference all the colors of the sky and sinks into the earth sweetly carrying moisture and refreshment where it falls i can do nothing for you you will not have my aid you reject my service then as i may not help you you must help me 
and dropping before her, he reverently took her hand and kissed it. I ask a very little thing of you. Pray for me. I know you are accustomed to pray, so it will be no trouble to you. You believe God hears you, and when I look at you, I believe it too. Only a pure woman can make faith possible to man. Pray for me, then, as one who has fallen from his higher and better self who strives but who may not attain, who labors under heavy punishment, who would fain reach heaven, but who by the cursed will of man and man alone is kept in hell. Pray for me, Mavis Clare, promise it, and so shall you lift me a step nearer the glory I have lost. I listened, petrified with amazement. Could this be Lucio, the mocking, careless, cynical scoffer I knew, as I thought, so well? Was it really he who knelt thus like a repentant sinner, abasing his proud head before a woman? I saw Mavis release her hand from his, the while she stood looking down upon him in alarm and bewilderment. Presently she spoke in sweet yet tremulous accents. "'Since you desire it so earnestly, I promise,' she said, "'I will pray that the strange and bitter sorrow which seems to consume you may be removed from your life. Sorrow, he echoed, interrupting her and springing to his feet with an impassioned gesture. Woman, genius, angel, whatever you are, do not speak of one sorrow from me. I have a thousand thousand sorrows, I a million million, that are as little flames about my heart, and as deeply seated as the centers of the universe, the foul and filthy crimes of men, the base deceits and cruelties of women, the ruthless, murderous ingratitude of children, the scorn of good, the martyrdom of intellect, the selfishness, the avarice, the sensuality of human life, the hideous blasphemy and sin of the creature to the creator. These are my endless sorrows. These keep me wretched and in chains, when I would fain be free. These create hell around me, and endless torture. These bind and crush me, and pervert my being till I become what I dare not name to myself or to others. And yet, as the eternal God is my witness, I do not think I am as bad as the worst man living. I may tempt, but I do not pursue. I take the lead in many lives, yet I make the way I go so plain that those who follow me do so by their own choice and free will, more than by my persuasion. He paused, then continued in a softer tone. You look afraid of me but be assured you never had less cause for terror. You have truth and purity. I honor both. You will have none of my advice or assistance in the making of your life's history. Tonight, therefore, we part to meet no more on earth. Never again, Mavis Clare. No, not through all your quiet days of sweet and contented existence will I cross your path. Before heaven I swear it. But why? asked Mavis gently, approaching him now as she spoke, with a soft grace of movement, and laying her hand on his arm. Why do you speak with such a passion of self-reproach? What dark cloud is on your mind? Surely you have a noble nature, and I feel that I have wronged you in my thoughts. You must forgive me. I have mistrusted you. You do well to mistrust me, he answered, and with these words he caught both her hands and held them in his own looking at her full in the face with eyes that flashed like jewels. Your instinct teaches you rightly. Would there were many more like you to doubt me and repel me? One word, if, when I am gone, you ever think of me, think that I am more to be pitied than the veriest paralyzed and starving wretch that ever crawled on earth, for he, perchance, has hope, and I have none. And when you pray for me, for I hold you to this promise. Pray for one who dares not pray for himself. You know the words, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Tonight you have been led into temptation, though you knew it not. But you have delivered yourself from evil, as only a true soul can. And now, farewell. In life I shall see you no more. In death, well, I have attended many deathbeds in response to the invitations of the moribund but I shall not be present at yours. Perhaps, when your parting spirit is on the verge between darkness and light, you may know who I was and am, and you may thank God with your last breath that we parted tonight, as we do now, forever. He loosened his grasp of her, 
she fell back from him pale and terrified for there was something now in the dark beauty of his face that was unnatural and appalling a sombre shadow clouded his brows his eyes had gleams in them as of fire and a smile was on his lips half tender half cruel his strange expression moved even me to a sense of fear and i shivered with sudden cold though the air was warm and balmy slowly retreating mavis moved away looking round at him now and then as she went in wistful wonder and alarm till in a minute or two her slight figure in its shimmering silken white robe had vanished among the trees i lingered hesitating and uncertain what to do then finally determining to get back to the house if possible without being noticed i made one step when lucio's voice scarcely raised addressed me well eavesdropper why did you not come out of the shadow of that elm tree and see the play to a better advantage surprised and confused i advanced mumbling some unintelligible excuse you saw a pretty bit of acting here he went on striking a match and lighting a cigar the while he regarded me coolly his eyes twinkling with their usual mockery you know my theory that all men and all women are purchasable for gold well i wanted to try mavis clare she rejected all my advantageous offers as you must have heard and i could only make matters smooth by asking her to pray for me that i did this very melodramatically i hope you will admit a woman of that dreamy idealistic temperament always likes to imagine that there is a man who is grateful for her prayers you seemed very much in earnest about it i said vexed with myself that he had caught me spying why of course he responded thrusting his arm familiarly through mine i had an audience two fastidious critics of dramatic art heard me rant my rantings i had to do my best two critics i repeated perplexedly yes you on one side lady sibyl on the other lady sibyl rose after the custom of fashionable beauties at the opera before the last scene in order to get home in good time for supper he laughed wildly and discordantly and i felt desperately uncomfortable you must be mistaken lucio i said that i listened i admit and it was wrong of me to do so but my wife would never condescend ah then it must have been a sylph of the woods that glided out of the shadow with a silken train behind her and diamonds in her hair he retorted gaily tut geoffrey don't look so crestfallen i have done with mavis clare and she with me i have not been making love to her i have simply just to amuse myself tested her character and i find it stronger than i thought the combat is over she will never go my way nor i fear shall i ever go hers upon my word lucio i said with some irritation your disposition seems to grow more and more erratic and singular every day does it not he answered with a droll affectation of interested surprise in himself i am a curious creature altogether wealth is mine and i care not a jot for it power is mine and i loathe its responsibility in fact i would rather be anything but what i am look at the lights of your home sweet home geoffrey this he said as we emerged from among the trees on to the moonlit lawn from whence could be seen the shining of the electric lamps in the drawing-room lady sibyl is there an enchanting and perfect woman who lives but to welcome you to her embracing arms fortunate man who would not envy you love who would who could exist without it save me who in europe at least would forgo the delights of kissing which the japanese by the by consider a disgusting habit without embraces and all those other endearments which are supposed to dignify the progress of true love one never tires of these things there is no satiety i wish i could love somebody so you can if you like i said with a little uneasy laugh i cannot it is not in me you heard me tell mavis clare as much i have it in my power to make other people fall in love somewhat after the dexterous fashion practised by matchmaking mothers but for myself love on this planet is too low a thing too brief in duration last night in a dream i have strange dreams at times i saw one whom possibly i could love but she was a spirit with eyes more lustrous than the morning and a form as transparent as flame she could sing sweetly 
and I watched her soaring upward and listened to her song. It was a wild song, and to many mortal ears meaningless. It was something like this. And his rich baritone pealed lusciously forth in melodious tune. Into the light, into the heart of the fire, to the innermost core of the deathless flame, I ascend, I aspire. Under me rolls the whirling earth, with the noise of a myriad wheels that run ever round and about the sun. Over me circles the splendid heaven, strewn with the stars of morn and even, and I, a queen of the air serene, float with my flag-like wings unfurled, alone, alone, twixt God and the world. Here he broke off with a laugh. She was a strange spirit, he said, because she could see nothing but herself twixt God and the world. She was evidently quite unaware of the numerous existing barriers put up by mankind between themselves and their maker. I wonder what unenlightened sphere she came from. I looked at him in mingled wonder and impatience. You talk wildly, I said, and you sing wildly, of things that mean nothing, and are nothing. He smiled, lifting his eyes to the moon, now shining her fullest and brightest. True, he replied. Things which have meaning and are valuable have all to do with money or appetite, Geoffrey. There is no wider outlook, evidently. But we were speaking of love, and I hold that love should be eternal as hate. Here you have the substance of my religious creed, if I have any, that there are two spiritual forces ruling the universe, love and hate, and that their incessant quarrel creates the general confusion of life. Both contend one against the other, and only at judgment day will it be proved which is the strongest. I am on the side of hate myself, for at present hate has scored all the victories worth winning, while love has been so often martyred that there is only the poor ghost of it left on earth. At that moment my wife's figure appeared at the drawing-room window, and Lucio threw away his half-smoked cigar. "'Your guardian angel beckons,' he said, looking at me with an odd expression of something like pity mingled with disdain. "'Let us go in.'" End of chapter 29「Chapter Thirty of the Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The very next night but one after Lucio's strange interview with Mavis Clare, the thunderbolt destined to wreck my life and humiliate me to the dust, fell with appalling suddenness. No warning given. It came at a moment when I had dared to deem myself happy. All that day, the last day I was ever to know of pride or self-gratulation. I had enjoyed life to the full. It was a day, too, in which Sybil had seemed transformed to a sweeter, gentler woman than I had hitherto known her. When all her attractions of beauty and manner were apparently put forth to captivate and enthrall me, as though she were yet to be wooed and won. Or did she mean to bewitch and subjugate Lucio? Of this I never thought, never dreamed. I only saw in my wife an enchantress of the most voluptuous and delicate loveliness. A woman whose very garments seemed to cling to her tenderly, as though proud of clothing so exquisite a form. A creature whose every glance was brilliant, whose every smile was a ravishment, and whose voice, attuned to the softest and most caressing tones, appeared in its every utterance to assure me of a deeper and more lasting love than I had yet enjoyed. The hours flew by on golden wings. We all three, Sybil, myself, and Lucio, had attained, as I imagined, to a perfect unity of friendship and mutual understanding. We had passed that last day together in the outlying woods of Willowsmere, under a gorgeous canopy of autumn leaves, through which the sun shed mellow beams of rose and gold. We had had an alfresco luncheon in the open air. Lucio had sung for us wild old ballads and love madrigals, till the very foliage had seemed to tremble with joy at the sound of such entrancing melody. And not a cloud had marred the perfect peace and pleasure of the time. Mavis Clare was not with us, and I was glad. Somehow I felt that of late she had been more or less a discordant element whenever she had joined our party. 
I admired her. In a sort of fraternal, half-patronizing way, I even loved her. Nevertheless, I was conscious that her ways were not as our ways, her thoughts not as our thoughts. I placed the fault on her, of course. I concluded that it was because she had what I elected to call literary egoism, instead of by its rightful name, the spirit of honorable independence. I never considered the inflated quality of my own egoism, the poor pride of a cash and county position, which is the pettiest sort of vainglory any one can indulge in, and after turning the matter over in my mind, I decided that Mavis was a very charming young woman with great literary gifts and an amazing pride, which made it totally impossible for her to associate with many great people, so called as she would never descend to the necessary level of flunkyish servility which they expected, and which I certainly demanded. I should almost have been inclined to relegate her to Grub Street, had not a faint sense of justice, as well as shame, held me back from doing her that indignity, even in my thoughts. However, I was too much impressed with my own vast resources of unlimited wealth, to realize the fact that any one who, like Mavis, earns independence by intellectual work and worth alone, is entitled to feel a far greater pride than those who by mere chance of birth or heritage become the possessors of millions. Then again, Mavis Clare's literary position was, though I liked her personally, always a kind of reproach to me when I thought of my own abortive efforts to win the laurels of fame, so that on the whole I was glad she did not spend that day with us in the woods. Of course, if I had paid any attention to the trifles which make up the sum of life, I should have remembered that Lucio had told her he would meet her no more on earth. But I judged this to be a mere trifle of hasty and melodramatic speech, without any intentional meaning. So my last twenty-four hours of happiness passed away in halcyon serenity. I felt a sense of deepening pleasure in existence and I began to believe that the future had brighter things in store for me than I had lately ventured to expect. Sybil's new phase of gentleness and tenderness towards me, combined with her rare beauty, seemed to augur that the misunderstandings between us would be of short duration, and that her nature, too early rendered harsh and cynical by a society education, would soften in time to that beautiful womanliness which is, after all, woman's best charm. Thus I thought, in blissful and contented reverie, reclining under the branching autumnal foliage, with my fair wife beside me, and listening to the rich tones of my friend Lucio's magnificent voice, pealing forth sonorous, wild melodies, as the sunset deepened in the sky, and the twilight shadows fell. Then came the night, the night which dropped only for a few hours over the quiet landscape, but forever over me. We had dined late, and pleasantly fatigued with our day in the open air, had retired early. I had latterly grown a heavy sleeper, and I suppose I must have slumbered some hours, when I was awakened suddenly, as though by an imperative touch from some unseen hand. I started up in my bed. The night lamp was burning dimly, and by its glimmer I saw that Sybil was no longer at my side. My heart gave one bound against my ribs, and then almost stood still. A sense of something unexpected and calamitous chilled my blood. I pushed aside the embroidered silken hangings of the bed and peered into the room. It was empty. Then I rose hastily, put on my clothes, and went to the door. It was carefully shut, but not locked, as it had been when we retired for the night. I opened it without the least noise and looked out into the long passage. No one there. Immediately opposite the bedroom door, there was a winding oak staircase leading down to a broad corridor, which in former times had been used as a music room or picture gallery. An ancient organ, still sweet of tone, occupied one end of it with dull golden pipes towering up to the carved and embossed ceiling. The other end was lit by a large oriel window like that of a church, filled with rare old stained glass, representing in various niches the lives of the saints, the centre subject being the martyrdom of St. Stephen. Advancing with soft caution to the balustrade overlooking this gallery, I gazed down into it, and for a moment could see nothing on the polished floor but the criss-cross patterns made by the moonlight falling through the great window. 
but presently as i watched breathlessly wondering where sibyl could have got to at this time of night i saw a dark tall shadow waver across the moonlit network of lines and i heard the smothered sound of voices with my pulses beating furiously and a sensation of suffocation in my throat full of strange thoughts and suspicions which i dared not define i crept slowly and stealthily down the stair till as my foot touched the last step i saw what nearly struck me to the ground with a shock of agony and i had to draw back and bite my lips hard to repress the cry that nearly escaped them there there before me in the full moonlight with the colours of the red and blue robes of the painted saints on the window glowing blood-red and azure about her knelt my wife arrayed in a diaphanous garment of filmy white which betrayed rather than concealed the outline of her form her wealth of hair falling about her in wild disorder her hands clasped in supplication her pale face upturned and above her towered the dark imposing figure of lucio i stared at the twain with dry burning eyes what did this portend was she my wife false was he my friend a traitor patience patience i muttered to myself this is a piece of acting doubtless such as chanced the other night with mavis clare patience let us hear this this comedy and drawing myself close up against the wall i leaned there scarcely drawing breath waiting for her voice for his when they spoke i should know yes i should know all and i fastened my looks on them as they stood there vaguely wondering even in my tense anguish at the fearful light on lucio's face a light which could scarcely be the reflection of the moon as he backed the window and at the scorn of his frowning brows what terrific humour swayed him why did he even to my stupefied thought appear more than human why did his very beauty seem hideous at that moment and his aspect fiendish hush hush she spoke my wife i heard her every word heard all and endured all without falling dead at her feet in the extremity of my dishonour and despair i love you she wailed lucio i love you and my love is killing me be merciful have pity on my passion love me for one hour one little hour it is not much to ask and afterwards do with me what you will torture me brand me an outcast in the public sight curse me before heaven i care nothing i am yours body and soul i love you her accents vibrated with mad idolatrous pleading i listened infuriated but dumb hush hush i told myself this is a comedy not yet played out and i waited with every nerve strained for lucio's reply it came accompanied by a laugh low and sarcastic you flatter me he said i regret i am unable to return the compliment my heart gave a throb of relief and fierce joy almost i could have joined in his ironical laughter she sibyl dragged herself nearer to him lucio lucio she murmured have you a heart can you reject me when i pray to you thus when i offer you all myself all that i am or ever hope to be am i so repugnant to you many men would give their lives if i would say to them what i say to you but they are nothing to me you alone are my world the breath of my existence ah lucio can you not believe will you not realize how deeply i love you he turned towards her with a sudden fierce movement that startled me and the cloud of scorn upon his brows grew darker i know you love me he said and from where i stood i saw the cold derisive smile flash from his lips to his eyes in lightning-like mockery i have always known it your vampire soul leapt to mine at the first glance i ever gave you you were a false foul thing from the first and you recognized your master yes your master for she had uttered a faint cry as if in fear and he stooping snatched her two hands and grasped them hard in his own listen to the truth of yourself for once from one who is not afraid to speak it you love me and truly your body and soul are mine to claim if i so choose you married with a lie upon your lips 
you swore fidelity to your husband before god with infidelity already in your thoughts and by your own act made the mystical blessing a blasphemy and a curse wonder not then that the curse has fallen i knew it all the kiss i gave you on your wedding day put fire in your blood and sealed you mine why you would have fled to me that very night had i demanded it had i loved you as you love me that is if you choose to call the disease of vanity and desire that riots in your veins by such a name as love but now hear me and as he held her two wrists he looked down upon her with such black wrath depicted in his face as seemed to create a darkness round him where he stood i hate you yes i hate you and all such women as you for you corrupt the world you turn good to evil you deepen folly into crime with the seduction of your nude limbs and lying eyes you make fools cowards and beasts of men when you die your bodies generate foulness things of the mould and slime are formed out of the flesh that was once fair for man's delight you are no use in life you become poison in death i hate you all i read your soul it is an open book to me and it is branded with a name given to those who are publicly vile but which should of strict right and justice be equally bestowed on women of your position and type who occupy pride and place in this world's standing and who have not the excuse of poverty for selling themselves to the devil he ceased abruptly and with passion making a movement as though to fling her from him but she clung to his arm clung with all the pertinacity of the loathly insect he had taken from the bosom of the dead egyptian woman and made a toy of to amuse his leisure and i looking on and listening honoured him for his plain speaking for his courage in telling this shameless creature what she was in the opinion of an honest man without glozing over her outrageous conduct for the sake of civility or social observance my friend my more than friend he was true he was loyal he had neither desire nor intent to betray or dishonour me my heart swelled with gratitude to him and also with a curious sense of feeble self-pity compassionating myself intensely i could have sobbed aloud in nervous fury and pain had not my desire to hear more repressed my personal excitement and emotion i watched my wife wonderingly what had become of her pride that she still knelt before the man who had taunted her with such words as should have been beyond all endurance lucio lucio she whispered and her whisper sounded the long gallery like the hiss of a snake say what you will say all you will of me you can say nothing that is not true i am vile i own it but is it of much avail to be virtuous what pleasure comes from goodness what gratification from self-denial there is no god to care a few years and we all die and are forgotten even by those who loved us why should we lose such joys as we may have for the mere asking surely it is not difficult to love even me for an hour am i not fair to look upon and is all this beauty of my face and form worthless in your sight and you no more than a man murder me as you may with all the cruelty of cruel words i care nothing i love you i love you and in a perfect passion of self-abandonment she sprang to her feet tossing back her rich hair over her shoulders and stood erect a very bacchante of wild loveliness look at me you shall not you dare not spurn such a love as mine dead silence followed her outburst and i stared in fascinated awe at lucio as he turned more fully round and confronted her the expression of his countenance struck me then as quite unearthly his beautiful broad brows were knitted in a darkling line of menace his eyes literally blazed with scorn and yet he laughed a low laugh resonant with satire shall not dare not he echoed disdainfully woman's words woman's ranting the shriek of the outraged feminine animal who fails to attract as she thinks her chosen mate such a love as yours what is it degradation to whosoever shall accept it shame to whosoever shall rely upon it you make a boast of your beauty your mirror shows you a pleasing image but your mirror lies as admirably as you do you see within it not the reflection of yourself for that would cause you to recoil in horror you merely look upon your fleshly covering a garment of tissues shrinkable perishable 
and only fit to mingle with the dust from which it sprang. Your beauty? I see none of it. I see you, and to me you are hideous, and will remain hideous for ever. I hate you. I hate you with the bitterness of an immeasurable and unforgiving hatred. For you have done me a wrong. You have wrought an injury upon me. You have added another burden to the load of punishment I carry. She made a forward movement with outstretched arms. He repulsed her by a fierce gesture. Stand back, he said. Be afraid of me, as of an unknown terror. Oh, pitiless heaven, to think of it. But a night ago I was lifted a step nearer to my lost delight. And now this woman drags me back and down and yet again I hear the barring of the gates of paradise. O oh, infinite torture! O oh, wicked souls of men and women! Is there no touch of grace or thought of God left in you? And will ye make my sorrows eternal? He stood, lifting his face to the light where it streamed through the oriel window, and the moonbeams coloring themselves faintly roseate as they filtered through the painted garments of St. Stephen, showed a great and terrible anguish in his eyes. I heard him with amazement and awe. I could not imagine what he meant by his strange words. And it was evident by her expression that my reckless and abandoned wife was equally mystified. Lucio, she murmured, Lucio, what is it? What have I done? I who would not wound you for the world. I who but seek your love, Lucio, to repay it in full with such fond passion and tenderness as you have never known. For this and this only I married Geoffrey. I chose your friend as husband because he was your friend. Oh, perfidious woman! And because I saw his foolish egotism, his pride in himself and his riches, his blind confidence in me and in you, I knew that I could, after a time, follow the fashion of many another woman in my set and choose my lover. Ah, my lover, I had chosen him already. I have chosen you, Lucio. Yes, though you hate me, you cannot hinder me from loving you. I shall love you till I die. He turned his gaze upon her steadily, the gloom deepening on his brows. And after you die, he said, will you love me then? There was a stern derision in his tone which appeared to vaguely terrify her. After death? she stammered. Yes, after death, he repeated somberly. There is an after as your mother knows. A faint exclamation escaped her. She fixed her eyes upon him affrightedly. Fair lady, he went on, your mother was, like yourself, a voluptuary. She, like you, made up her mind to follow the fashion, as you put it, as soon as her husband's blind or willing confidence was gained. She chose not one lover, but many. You know her end. In the written but miscomprehended laws of nature, a diseased body is the natural expression of a diseased mind. Her face in her last days was the reflex of her soul. You shudder. The thought of her hideousness is repellent to your self-conscious beauty. Yet the evil that was in her is also in you. It festers in your blood slowly, but surely, as you have no faith in God to cure the disease, it will have its way, even at the final moment when death clutches at your throat and stops your breathing. The smile upon your frozen lips, then, will not be the smile of a saint, believe me, but of a sinner. Death is never deceived, though life may be. And afterwards, I ask again, will you love me, do you think, when you know who I am? I was myself startled at his manner of putting this strange question. I saw her lift her hands beseechingly towards him, and she seemed to tremble. When I know who you are, she repeated wonderingly, do I not know? You are Lucio, Lucio Rimenez, my love, my love, whose voice is my music, whose beauty I adore, whose looks are my heaven. And hell, he interposed with a low laugh. Come here. She went towards him eagerly, yet falteringly. He pointed to the ground. I saw the rare blue diamond he always wore on his right hand flash like a flame in the moon rays. Since you love me so well, he said, kneel down and worship me. She dropped on her knees and clasped her hands. I strove to move, to speak, but some resistless force held me dumb and motionless. The light from the stained glass window fell upon her face and showed its fairness illumined by a smile of perfect rapture. With every pulse of my being I worship you, 
she murmured passionately. My king, my god, the cruel things you say but deepen my love for you. You can kill, but you can never change me. For one kiss of your lips I would die. For one embrace from you I would give my soul. Have you one to give? he asked derisively. Is it not already disposed of? You should make sure of that first. Stay where you are and let me look at you. So, a woman wearing a husband's name, holding a husband's honor, clothed in the very garments purchased with a husband's money, and newly risen from a husband's side, steals forth thus in the night, seeking to disgrace him and pollute herself by the vulgarest unchastity. And this is all that the culture and training of nineteenth-century civilization can do for you? Myself, I prefer the barbaric fashion of old times, when rough savages fought for their women as they fought for their cattle, treated them as cattle, and kept them in their place, never dreaming of endowing them with such strong virtues as truth and honor. If women were pure and true, then the lost happiness of the world might return to it. But the majority of them are like you, liars, ever pretending to be what they are not. I may do what I choose with you, you say torture you, kill you, brand you with the name of outcast in the public sight, and curse you before heaven, if I will only love you? All this is melodramatic speech, and I never cared for melodrama at any time. I shall neither kill you, brand you, curse you, nor love you. I shall simply call your husband. I stirred from my hiding place, then stopped. She sprang to her feet in an insensate passion of anger and shame. You dare not! she panted. You dare not so disgrace me. Disgrace you, he echoed scornfully. That remark comes rather late, seeing you have disgraced yourself. But she was now fairly roused. All the savagery and obstinacy of her nature was awakened, and she stood like some beautiful wild animal at bay, trembling from head to foot with the violence of her emotions. You repulse me, you scorn me, she muttered in hurried fierce accents that scarcely rose above an angry whisper make a mockery of my heart's anguish and despair, but you shall suffer for it. I am your match, nay, your equal. You shall not spurn me a second time. You ask, will I love you when I know who you are? It is your pleasure to deal in mysteries, but I have no mysteries. I am a woman who loves you with all the passion of a life, and I will murder myself and you rather than live to know that I have prayed you for your love in vain. Do you think I came unprepared? No and she suddenly drew from her bosom a short steel dagger with a jewelled hilt, a curio I recognized as one of the gifts to her on our marriage. Love me, I say, or I will stab myself dead here at your feet, and cry out to Geoffrey that you have murdered me. She raised the weapon aloft. I almost sprang forward, but I drew back again quickly as I saw Lucio seize the hand that held the dagger and drag it firmly down while, wresting the weapon from her clutch, he snapped it asunder and flung the pieces on the floor. "'Your place was on the stage, madame,' he said. "'You should have been the chief female mime at some high-class theatre. You would have adorned the boards, drawn the mob, had as many lovers, stagey and private, as you pleased, been invited to act at Windsor, obtained a payment jewel from the Queen, and written your name in her autograph album.' That should undoubtedly have been your great career. You were born for it, made for it. You would have been as brute sold as you are now. But that would not have mattered. Mimes are exempt from chastity. In the action of breaking the dagger, and in the intense bitterness of his speech, he had thrust her back a few paces from him, and she stood breathless and white with rage, eyeing him in mingled passion and terror. For a moment she was silent. Then advancing slowly with the feline suppleness of movement which had given her a reputation for grace, exceeding that of any woman in England, she said in deliberately measured accents, Lucio Rimenez, I have borne your insults as I would bear my death at your hands, because I love you. You loathe me, you say. You repulse me. I love you still. You cannot cast me off. I am yours. You shall love me or I will die. One of the two. Take time for thought. I leave you to-night. I give you all to-morrow to consider. Love me, give me yourself, be my lover, and I will play the comedy of social life as well as any other woman, so well that my husband shall never know. But refuse me again, as you have refused me now, and I will make away with myself. I am not acting. I am speaking calmly and with conviction. I mean what I say. Do you? 
queried Lucio coldly. Let me congratulate you. Few women attain to such coherence. I will put an end to this life of mine, she went on, paying no sort of heed to his words. I cannot endure existence without your love, Lucio. And a dreary pathos vibrated in her voice. I hunger for the kisses of your lips, the clasp of your arms. Do you know? Do you ever think of your own power, the cruel, terrible power of your eyes, your speech, your smile, the beauty which makes you more like an angel than a man? And have you no pity? Do you think that ever a man was born like you? He looked at her as she said this, and a faint smile rested on his lips. When you speak, I hear music. When you sing, it seems to me that I understand what the melodies of a poet's heaven must be. Surely, surely you know that your very looks are a snare to the warm, weak soul of a woman. Lucio! And emboldened by his silence, she stole nearer to him. Meet me tomorrow in the lane, near the cottage of Mavis Clare. He started as if he had been stung, but not a word escaped him. I heard all you said to her the other night she continued, advancing yet a step closer to his side. I followed you, and I listened. I was well-nigh mad with jealousy. I thought, I feared, you loved her. But I was wrong. I never do thank God for anything, but I thanked God that night that I was wrong. She was not made for you. I am. Meet me outside her house, where the great white rose-tree is in bloom. Gather one, one of those little autumnal roses, and give it to me. I shall understand it as a signal, a signal that I may come to you tomorrow night and not be cursed or repulsed, but loved, loved. Ah, oh, Lucio, promise me one little rose, the symbol of an hour's love. Then let me die. I shall have had all I ask of life. With a sudden swift movement she flung herself upon his breast, and circling her arms about his neck, lifted her face to his. The moonbeams showed me her eyes alit with rapture her lips trembling with passion, her bosom heaving. The blood surged up to my brain, and a red mist swam before my sight. Would Lucio yield? Not he. He loosened her desperate hands from about his throat, and forced her back, holding her at arm's length. "'Woman, false and accursed,' he said in tones that were sonorous and terrific. "'You know not what you seek. All that you ask of life shall be yours in death. This is the law.' Therefore beware what demands you make, lest they be too fully granted. A rose from the cottage of Mavis Clare? A rose from the garden of Eden? They are one and the same to me, not for my gathering or yours. Love and joy? For the unfaithful there is no love. For the impure there is no joy. Add no more to the measure of my hatred and vengeance. Go while there is yet time. Go and front the destiny you have made for yourself, for nothing can alter it. And as for me, whom you love, before whom you have knelt in idolatrous worship, and a low, fierce laugh escaped him. Why, restrain your feverish desires, fair fiend. Have patience. We shall meet ere long. I could not bear the scene another moment, and springing from my hiding place, I dragged my wife away from him and flung myself between them. Let me defend you, Lucio, from the pertinacities of this wanton, I cried with a wild burst of laughter. An hour ago I thought she was my wife. I find her nothing but a purchased chattel who seeks a change of masters. End of chapter 30、Chapter 31. Of the Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For one instant we all three stood facing each other, I breathless and mad with fury, Lucio calm and disdainful, my wife staggering back from me, half swooning with fear. In an access of black rage I rushed upon her and seized her in my arms. I have heard you, I said. I have seen you. I have watched you kneel before my true friend, my loyal comrade there, and try your best to make him as vile as yourself. I am that poor fool, your husband, that blind egoist, whose confidence you sought to win, and to betray. I am the unhappy wretch whose surplus of world's cash has bought for him in marriage a shameless courtesan. You dare to talk of love? 
you profane its very name good god what are such women as you made of you throw yourselves into our arms you demand our care you exact our respect you tempt our senses you win our hearts and then you make fools of us all fools and worse than fools you make us men without feeling conscience faith or pity if we become criminals what wonder if we do things that shame our sex is it not because you set us the example god god i who loved you yes loved you in spite of all that my marriage with you taught me i who would have died to save you from a shadow of suspicion i am the one out of all the world you choose to murder by your treachery i loosened my grasp of her she recovered her self-possession by an effort and looked at me straightly with cold unfeeling eyes what did you marry me for she demanded for my sake or your own i was silent too choked with wrath and pain to speak all i could do was to hold out my hand to lucio who grasped it with a cordial and sympathetic pressure yet i fancied he smiled was it because you desired to make me happy out of pure love for me pursued sibyl or because you wished to add dignity to your own position by wedding the daughter of an earl your motives were not unselfish you chose me simply because i was the beauty of the day whom london men stared at and talked of and because it gave you a certain prestige to have me for your wife in the same way as it gave you a footing with royalty to be the owner of the derby winner i told you honestly what i was before our marriage it made no effect upon your vanity and egoism i never loved you i could not love you and i told you so you have heard so you say all that is passed between me and lucio therefore you know why i married you i state it boldly to your face it was that i might have your intimate friend for my lover that you should pretend to be scandalized at this is absurd it is a common position of things in france and is becoming equally common in england morality has always been declared unnecessary for men it is becoming equally unnecessary for women i stared at her amazed at the glibness of her speech and the cool convincing manner in which she spoke after her recent access of passion and excitement you have only to read the new fiction she went on a mocking smile lighting up her pale face and indeed all new literature generally to be assured that your ideas of domestic virtue are quite out of date both men and women are according to certain accepted writers of the day at equal liberty to love when they will and where they may polygamous purity is the new creed such love in fact so we are taught constitutes the only sacred union if you want to alter this movement and return to the old-fashioned types of the modest maiden and the immaculate matron you must sentence all the new writers of profitable pruriency to penal servitude for life and institute a government censorship of the modern press as matters stand your attitude of the outraged husband is not only ridiculous it is unfashionable i assure you i do not feel the slightest prick of conscience in saying i love lucio any woman might be proud of loving him he however will not or cannot love me we have had a scene and you have completed the dramatic effect by witnessing it there is no more to be said or done in the affair i do not suppose you can divorce me but if you can you may i shall make no defence she turned as if to go I still stared dumbly at her, finding no words to cope with her effrontery. When Lucio's voice, attuned to a grave and soothing suavity, interposed, This is a very painful and distressing state of things, he said, and the strange, half-cynical, half-contemptuous smile still rested on his lips. But I must positively protest against the idea of divorce, not only for her ladyship's sake, but my own i am entirely innocent in the matter innocent i exclaimed grasping him again by the hand you are nobility itself lucio as loyal a friend as ever man had i thank you for your courage for the plain and honest manner in which you have spoken i heard all you said nothing was too strong 
nothing could be too strong to awaken this misguided woman to a sense of her outrageous conduct her unfaithfulness pardon me he interrupted delicately the lady sibyl can scarcely be called unfaithful geoffrey she suffers from let us call it a little exaltation of nerves in thought she may be guilty of infidelity but society does not know that and in act she is pure pure as the newly driven snow and as the newly driven snow will society itself immaculate regard her his eyes glittered i met his chilled derisive glance you think as i do lucio i said hoarsely you feel with me that a wife's unchaste thought is as vile as her unchaste act there is no excuse no palliative for such cruel and abominable ingratitude why and my voice rose unconsciously as i turned fiercely again toward sibyl did i not free you and your family from the heavy pressure of poverty and debt have i grudged you anything are you not loaded with jewels have you not greater luxuries and liberties than a queen and do you not owe me at least some duty i owe you nothing she responded boldly i gave you what you paid for my beauty and my social position it was a fair bargain a dear and bitter one i cried maybe so but such as it was you struck it not i you can end it when you please the law the law will give you no freedom in such a case interposed lucio with a kind of satirical urbanity a judicial separation on the ground of incompatibility of temper might be possible certainly but would not that be a pity her ladyship is unfortunate in her tastes that is all she selected me as her cavalier servente and i refused the situation hence there is nothing for it but to forget this unpleasant incident and try to live on a better understanding for the future do you think said my wife advancing with her proud head uplifted in scorn the while she pointed at me do you think i will live with him after what he has seen and heard to-night what do you take me for for a very charming woman of hasty impulses and unwise reasoning replied lucio with an air of sarcastic gallantry lady sibyl you are illogical most of your sex are you can do no good by prolonging this scene a most unpleasant and trying one to us poor men you know how we hate scenes let me beg of you to retire your duty is to your husband pray heaven he may forget this midnight delirium of yours and set it down to some strange illness rather than to any evil intention for all answer she came towards him stretching out her arms in wild appeal lucio she cried lucio my love good-night good-bye i sprang between him and her advancing form before my very face i exclaimed oh infamous woman have you no shame none she said with a wild smile i glory in my love for such a king of worth and beauty look at him and then look at yourself in the nearest mirror that reflects so poor and mean a picture of a man how even in your egoism could you deem it possible for a woman to love you when he was near stand out of the light you interpose a shadow between my god and me as she uttered these mad words her aspect was so strange and unearthly that out of sheer stupefied wonder i mechanically did as she bade me and stood aside she regarded me fixedly i may as well say good-bye to you also she observed for i shall never live with you again nor i with you i said fiercely nor i with you nor i with you she repeated like a child saying a lesson of course not if i do not live with you you cannot live with me she laughed discordantly then turned her beseeching gaze once more upon Lucio. "'Good-bye,' she said. He looked at her with a curious fixity, but returned no word in answer. His eyes flashed coldly in the moonlight like sharp steel, and he smiled. She regarded him with such passionate intentness that it seemed as though she sought to draw his very soul into herself by the magnetism of her glance. But he stood unmoved, a very statue of fine disdain and intellectual self-repression 
my scarcely controlled fury broke out again at the sight of her dumb yearning, and I gave vent to a shout of scornful laughing. "'By heaven, a veritable new Venus and reluctant Adonis!' I cried deliriously. "'A poet should be here to immortalize so touching a scene. Go, go!' and I motioned her away with a furious gesture. "'Go if you do not want me to murder you. Go with the proud consciousness that you have worked all the mischief and ruin that is most dear to the heart of a woman. You have spoilt a life and dishonored a name. You can do no more. Your feminine triumph is complete. Go! Would to God I might never see your face again. Would to God I had been spared the misery of having married you.' She paid no attention whatever to my words but kept her eyes fixed on Lucio. Retreating slowly, she seemed to feel rather than see her way to the winding stair, and there, turning, she began to ascend. Halfway up she paused, looked back and fully confronted us once more. With a wild, wicked rapture on her face, she kissed her hands to Lucio, smiling like a spectral woman in a dream. Then she went onward and upward, step by step, till the last white fold of her robe had vanished, and we too, my friend and I, were alone. Facing one another we stood, silently. I met his sombre eyes, and thought I read an infinite compassion in them. Then, while I yet looked upon him, something seemed to clutch my throat and stop my breathing. His dark and beautiful countenance appeared to me to grow suddenly lurid as with fire. A coronal of flame seemed to tremble above his brows. The moonlight glistened blood-red. A noise was in my ears of mingled thunder and music, as though the silent organ at the end of the gallery were played by hands invisible. Struggling against these delusive sensations, I involuntarily stretched out my hands. Lucio, I gasped. Lucio, my friend, I think I am dying. My heart is broken. As I spoke, a great blackness closed over me, and I fell senseless. End of chapter 31「3 The Sorrows of Satan」by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oh, the blessedness of absolute unconsciousness! It is enough to make one wish that death were indeed annihilation. Utter oblivion, complete destruction. Surely this would be a greater mercy to the erring soul of man than the terrible God's gift of immortality. The dazzling impress of that divine image of the Creator in which we are all made, and which we can never obliterate from our beings. I, who have realized to the full the unalterable truth of eternal life, eternal regeneration for each individual spirit in each individual human creature, look upon the endless futures through which I am compelled to take my part with something more like horror than gratitude. For I have wasted my time and thrown away priceless opportunities. And though repentance may retrieve these, the work of retrieval is long and bitter. It is easier to lose a glory than to win it, and if I could have died the death that positivists hope for at the very moment when I learned the full measure of my heart's desolation, surely it would have been well. But my temporary swoon was only too brief, and when I recovered I found myself in Lucio's own apartment, one of the largest and most sumptuously furnished of all the guest chambers at Willowsmere. The windows were wide open, and the floor was flooded with moonlight. As I shuddered coldly back to life and consciousness, I heard a tinkling sound of tune, and opening my eyes wearily, I saw Lucio himself, seated in the full radiance of the moon, with a mandolin on his knee, from which he was softly striking delicate impromptu melodies. I was amazed at this, astounded that while I personally was overwhelmed with a weight of woe, he should still be capable of amusing himself. It is a common idea with us all that when we ourselves are put out, no one else should dare to be merry. In fact, we expect nature itself to wear a miserable face if our own beloved ego is disturbed by any trouble. Such is the extent of our ridiculous self-consciousness. 
I moved in my chair and half rose from it. When Lucio, still thrumming the strings of his instrument, piano pianissimo, said, Keep still, Geoffrey. You'll be all right in a few minutes. Don't worry yourself. Worry myself, I echoed bitterly. Why not say don't kill yourself? Because I see no necessity to offer you that advice at present, he responded coolly. And if there were necessity, I doubt if I should give it because I consider it better to kill oneself than to worry oneself. However, opinions differ. I want you to take this matter lightly. Lightly? Take my own dishonor and disgrace lightly? I exclaimed, almost leaping from my chair. You ask too much. My good fellow, I ask no more than is asked and expected of a hundred society husbands today. Consider, your wife has been led away from her soberer judgment and reasoning, by an exalted and hysterical passion for me on account of my looks, not for myself at all, because she really does not know me. She only sees me as I appear to be. The love of handsome exterior personalities is a common delusion of the fair sex, and passes in time like other women's diseases. No actual dishonor or disgrace attaches to her or to you. Nothing has been seen, heard, or done in public. This being so, I can't understand what you are making a fuss about. The great object of social life, you know, is to hide all the savage passions and domestic differences from the gaze of the vulgar crowd. You can be as bad as you like in private, only God sees, and that does not matter. His eyes had a mocking luster in them. Twanging his mandolin, he sang under his breath, If she be not fair for me, what care I how fair she be? That is the true spirit, Geoffrey, he went on. It sounds flippant to you, no doubt, in your present tragic frame of mind, but it is the only way to treat women, in marriage or out of it. Before the world and society, your wife is like Caesar's, above suspicion. Only you and I, we will leave God out, have been the witnesses of her attack of hysteria. Hysteria, you call it? She loves you, I said hotly, and she has always loved you, she confessed it, and you admitted that you always knew it. I always knew she was hysterical, yes, if that is what you mean, he answered. The majority of women have no real feelings, no serious emotions, except one, vanity. They do not know what a great love means. Their chief desire is for conquest, and failing in this, they run up the gamut of baffled passion to the pitch of frenetic hysteria, which with some becomes chronic. Lady Sybil suffers in this way. Now listen to me. I will go off to Paris or Moscow or Berlin at once. After what has happened, of course I cannot stay here, and I give you my word I will not intrude myself into your domestic circle again. In a few days you will tide over this rupture, and learn the wisdom of supporting the differences that occur in matrimony, with composure. Impossible! I will not part with you, I said vehemently, nor will I live with her. Better the companionship of a true friend than that of a false wife. He raised his eyebrows with a puzzled half-humorous expression, then shrugged his shoulders as one who gives up a difficult argument. Rising, he put aside his mandolin, and came over to me, his tall, imposing figure, casting a gigantic shadow in the brilliant moonbeams. Upon my word, you put me in a very awkward position, Geoffrey. What is to be done? You can get a judicial separation, if you like, but I think it would be an unwise course of procedure, after barely four months of marriage. The world would be set talking at once. Really, it is better to do anything than give the gossips a chance for floating scandal. Look here. Don't decide anything hastily. Come up to town with me for a day, and leave your wife alone to meditate upon her foolishness and its possible consequences. Then you will be better able to judge as to your future movements. Go to your room, and sleep till morning. Sleep? I repeated with a shudder. In that room where she— I broke off with a cry and looked at him imploringly. Am I going mad, I wonder? My brain seems on fire. If I could forget, if I could forget, Lucio, if you, my loyal friend, had been false to me, I should have died. Your truth, your honor have saved me. He smiled, an odd, cynical little smile. 
tut i make no boast of virtue he rejoined if the lady's beauty had been any temptation to me i might have yielded to her charms in so doing i should have been no more than man as she herself suggested but perhaps i am more than man at any rate bodily beauty in woman makes no sort of effect on me unless it is accompanied by beauty of soul then it does make an effect and a very extraordinary one it provokes me to try how deep the beauty goes whether it is impervious or vulnerable as i find it so i leave it i stared wearily at the moonlight patterns on the floor what am i to do i asked what would you advise come up to town with me he replied you can leave a note for your wife explaining your absence and at one of the clubs we will talk over the matter quietly and decide how best to avoid a social scandal meanwhile go to bed if you won't go back to your own room sleep in the spare one next to mine i rose mechanically and prepared to obey him he watched me furtively will you take a composing draught if i mixed it for you he said it is harmless and will give you a few hours sleep i would take poison from your hand i answered recklessly why don't you mix that for me and then then i should sleep indeed and forget this horrible night no unfortunately you would not forget he said going to his dressing-case and taking out a small white powder which he dissolved gradually in a glass of water that is the worst of what people call dying i must instruct you in a little science by and by to distract your thoughts the scientific part of death the business that goes on behind the scenes you know will interest you very much it is highly instructive particularly that section of it which i am entitled to call the regeneration of atoms the brain cells are atoms and within these are other atoms called memories curiously vital and marvelously prolific drink this and he handed me the mixture he had prepared for temporary purposes it is much better than death because it does numb and paralyze the conscious atoms for a little while whereas death only liberates them to a larger and more obstinate vitality i was too self-absorbed to heed or understand his words but i drank what he gave me submissively and returned the glass he still watched me closely for about a minute then he opened the door of the apartment which adjoined his own throw yourself on that bed and close your eyes he continued in somewhat peremptory accents till morning breaks i give you a respite and he smiled strangely both from dreams and memories plunge into oblivion my friend brief as it is and as it must ever be it is sweet even to a millionaire the ironical tone of his voice vexed me i looked at him half reproachfully and saw his proud beautiful face pale as marble clear-cut as a cameo soften as i met his eyes i felt he was sorry for me despite his love of satire and grasping his hand i pressed it fervently without offering any other reply then going into the next room as he bade me i lay down and falling asleep almost instantly i remembered no more End of chapter thirty two